Thank you very much for having me on your ministry. And um, we are in the prayer group, the prayer chat group together, Sharon. And um, that's been really wonderful um, to have that kind of support that we can reach out and connect to each other. Um, so anyway, um, and it's all, it's nice to be here with all of you. Thank you very much for having me. So anyway, tonight I am going to talk a little bit about my story, but um, I think you all know that I, I was working, well, maybe you don't know, um, I was working as a nanny in Boston. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little, in a little bit, but your second quote talking about how children need to be raised in the country. I'm going to be talking about that tonight um, because I want you all to know how rich, fancy people are raising their children these days. And it is very similar to the spirit of prophecy recommendations. And, um, and I was very touched by how you said your children were transformed, Sharon, because I've had that exact same experience myself. But anyway, um, okay. So, um, so I have, um, I have been a Seventh-day Adventist all my life, culturally speaking, but I've definitely had different points of conversion. Um, one of the last points of conversion that I had was probably about, I guess, four or starting. Well, I, I got divorced, I think around 2014, maybe the end of 2013. I can't quite remember um, anymore. But anyway, I got divorced and that was a really low time for me. And um, I did not want to stay in the state of depression that I was in. And so I started doing a lot of volunteering. Um, and one of the things I volunteered for was um, my, a friend of mine had a health food store here in Southern Illinois. And um, I um, went to, um, I went to, I came here to volunteer for her. Um, she had broken her back and needed somebody to mind the store. And so I minded the store and ended up purchasing the store. Um, but that was the second time that the Lord moved me back here to this area in Southern Illinois. And now I'm here again for the third time. And um, I consider myself, uh, my preference is to live on the coast. I prefer to live on the coast, but um, the Lord had me over here in the Midwest. So um, I have uh, made plans to stay in the Midwest because I think this is where the Lord is going to keep me. Um, but anyway, so I had the health food store and it was just a health food store at the time. And I added a plant-based farm to table component um, and I ran it for a few years. Um, I had the plant-based farm component because I had a, a plant-based cafe. Um, so I look back at that time as a really happy time. Um, I had a lot of volunteers from the community that helped me to run the health food store and, um, and the community and I cooperated to build up this health food store. It did not, it was not a prosperous venture, but it was a very effective venture. Um, we had guest speakers, we had special events. Um, many people turned their health around. Uh, a lot of literature was given out and many people in loved it, including myself. And when the store shut down, it was very, very painful for all of us. Um, eventually Walmart and Amazon.com became my biggest competitors and the lo local grocery stores. They were just able to um, sell stuff cheaper and with more of a variety than I could. And I went out of business. I did not have enough customers for my plant-based um, health food store. Um, and I had a very hard financial ending to the store and had no recourses for, uh, in, for employment. Um, my degree is a liberal arts degree, which is pretty useless when you're out in the country, you really should have some good skills. And so I was stuck out in the country with nothing and no money. And it was just a very hard time. And so um, I spent three months after that just crying my eyeballs out and praying to the Lord and asking him to turn my life around and to help me to draw closer to him. Um, 
by the way, I'm sorry for the background noise. Um, I, my mom's having worship. So anyway, um, out of the blue, one of my um, former clients called me up. Um, I, so for quite a bit of my life, I've worked either as a manager or with children, either as a nanny or I owned a daycare or something like this. Anyway, um, so one of my former clients called me up and said, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so, our mutual friend is looking for a nanny. Would you consider doing this in Boston? And I said, yes, I would. I was thrilled to get out of the Midwest, thrilled to go to the East Coast, and I am just really crazy about New England. So I moved over there and um, I, you know, I had, well, I'll just be frank with you all. I had no money. Uh, while I had the health food store, I had gone through three vehicles that year and I didn't have a car at the time. Um, I was just very, it was just a tough situation. I'd gone from the divorce to the health food store, hadn't made a lot of money and then, you know, on to the next step. So it was definitely a tough situation. Um, so I, during this season of prayer, I asked the Lord for a car. I asked him very specifically. I said, I would like a four wheel drive with a roof rack. I would like the car to be in excellent shape and I don't want to have any breakdowns or anything. And out of nowhere, a friend called me up and said, hey, we have this car, here it is, it's yours. And that was miraculous. Um, and so I took the car and I moved to Boston and I got a job making four times as much as I had, which was not a lot at the health food store. Um, but I made four times as much money and I had a dreamy, wonderful, perfect life in so many ways. Um, and one of the things I had some financial catching up to do. And as you know, probably rent in any big city, but especially Boston was is incredibly expensive. And um, so I did not want to be taking all the money I was making and putting it into rent. And um, I prayed to the Lord and asked him for help. I went onto Google and I typed into Google work for rent. And I found a job position working as an Airbnb manager um, on the weekends for an Airbnb that I could live at the Airbnb, I would have my room taken care of, and I would be the manager of the Airbnb after my nanny job and on the weekends. And of course, I let them know that I was not available to work Friday to Saturday night, um, but I would manage the place the rest of the time. So I got free rent, a good paying job, and a car that the Lord gave me. I'd also like to take an opportunity and say that as much as wonderful as life was at my health food store, there were some areas in my life that I was not spiritually surrendered in. And um, I feel that some of that may have contributed to my, um, some of the difficulty I had at the health food store. And I needed to really um, align myself with the Lord. And that was definitely what the three months were for. But in addition to that, um, I, I got the job as an Airbnb manager living in the city of Salem, Massachusetts. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are familiar with Salem, Massachusetts, but it is a city that is completely dedicated to witchcraft. And, um, and the satanic temple was one mile away from my house and people, the Airbnb guests came specifically to the city because everybody is interested in witchcraft in the city. And um, I was not, I had heard some about the Salem witchcraft trials before I moved there, but I was not familiar to the extent with how satanic that city was. Um, so when I got there, I, I had the opportunity to begin to observe the Satanists. 
and they are at every level in society. I think that sometimes we think witchcraft is limited to, you know, the backwoods, coven here or there. No, people from the top of society all the way down to the bottom, professors, doctors, lawyers, um, all the way down to the bottom are involved in Satanism. And some of them were my guests. And um, we had supernatural things happening in the house. I personally had just come from this situation where I was getting my life right with the Lord. And so I was very, very intent on um, being spiritually close with the Lord. And I believe that's what kept me during that time. And I was very vocal about um, not being involved in the least with any of the activities. But I did learn from the Satanists how to be a good Christian because the Satanists are very, very ardent people. They are obedient, they are dedicated, they are zealous, they are evangelizers, they are busy. Um, so anyway, um, I also lived uh, near the waterfront, across the street from the waterfront, and that was also quite a popular draw in Salem. And um, and there were lots of festivals and events that went on. It was not all bad. In fact, it's it's a lovely city during the daytime. I did have the opportunity to be there during Halloween, and it is very spooky. And uh, at Halloween, um, the city hires 800 additional police officers to come in. And I had not intended to walk outside on Halloween evening, but um, I had to run an errand. And, that came up at the last minute. And there was a very palpable, thick darkness uh, in the city, a spiritual darkness. And um, it was just really terrible. So I was as pleased as I could be to get out of that city as soon as I could. But um, anyway, I want to talk a little bit now. I wanna transition a little bit to my nannying. So I really, really love to work with children, especially incredibly bright children that are emotionally difficult. I don't know why, but I just really love it. Um, and I've worked with many of them. And I would say that the key to my success was um, being spiritually aligned with Jesus. Um, there is definitely a very supernatural way that Satan tries to um, access people through children, and um, you can really lose self-control if you are not surrendered to Jesus. So, um, and I also got a lot of material from the Spirit of Prophecy and from Empowered Living. If any of you are familiar with Jim and Sally Honenberg, uh, Honenberger, um, I got a lot of material on how to deal with children through them. And so, um, I I was in charge of the children's um, everything, really. I was their mother when their mother was not there. And, um, and so I did treat those children if, as if they were my own. And I did the very best based on the spirit of prophecy, knowing that I would have to give an account for the children. Um, one of the things that I did was take the children out in nature all of the time all of the time and they did very, very well. We went bike riding, we went hiking, we volunteered. Um, I made the children volunteer and clean up parks and beaches and um, we did everything that we could outside. And I find that children are very, very manageable outside because there are not a lot of rules. If they wanna climb and run and jump and scream, then they can. And, um, and they can be themselves, they can express their deepest thoughts to you, and they can have integrity to themselves, and their focus is not on themselves, their focus is um, on the outdoors. So um, now, during this time, I was able to select um, have a part in selecting a school for where this eldest child was going to attend school. Um, there is, in Boston, you can imagine there are very many fancy schools, and there was a particular school, I won't name it, that was incredibly fancy. It's the kind of school that all the people from Harvard and MIT, and I'm not sure if you've heard of Exeter Phillips Academy, um, but that's a fancy prep school. They all sent their children there. 
and their school. I, when I went to interview at this school and see what my employer asked me, what I would think of this school, I was blown away. So I will share with you what was um, so remarkable at the school. Um, the first thing is that the children were permitted to walk around to do their learning. They were free to get up. Um, if they wanted to sit to learn, they could sit. If they wanted to walk around, they could learn. You do that. If they wanted to have special seating, if they needed to be accommodated in a special way, they could. Um, they also did not have a traditional cu curriculum. They had a um, they had a curriculum that was invented so it would be tailored for the students and what the students were interested in. And then they would bring the component, the component of education into the curriculum. So if the children was, were interested, say, in studying revolutions and how a revolution happened, then everything, all the science, all the math, everything was tailored around that. So it would be like 3D learning. And this is how the children's education would go. If they needed help in math, um, there was a special, two special instructors that ran the math for the entire school and their math was tailored so that um, the children could move from level to level, either forward or backward as they had gaps in education or as slowly or as quickly as they needed to learn. The school was from kindergarten through 10th grade and they had math from kindergarten up to college level calculus available for the children. Um, they also had someone uh, from MIT who set up a lab for, for them, a science lab, and the children were taught any kind of science they wanted to learn. I'll tell you what really blew my mind. Um, the children were taught CRISPR. I'm not sure if you're familiar with CRISPR. I was not familiar with CRISPR until this, but CRISPR is a gene editing software. And, um, and somebody came in and taught the children how to do gene editing. And there was a 12 year old who gave us all a lecture on gene editing and told us about his science experiment and it blew me away. And, um, and he was even working with some scientists at MIT teaching them this. Um, let's see what else was interesting. Oh, they had a woodworking shop over there. They had a culinary shop. The children learned how to do cooking. They learned how to do sewing. Um, they learned how to do building. Um, and if you're thinking to yourself, this sounds like Ellen White, yeah. That's what I thought to myself. She says how children should be educated and the types of things that they should be educated in. And it really, um, I thought to myself, what's happening is the rich children of our society are living as Ellen White recommended and everybody else is being herded into these um, public schools that are, um, that are, um, you know, kind of like copy little um, automaton copy making um, assembly lines for the children. Um, and let me switch to another thing, outdoors. Um, the children's outdoor playground was very interesting. Um, they had a backyard setting where they had set up swings and monkey bars. Um, they had set up climbing ropes, they had tires, sticks, they had, I mean, it for a school, I think it costs like 20 or $30,000 a year to send your child to the school. But for the backyard, they believed that the children needed to have free play and that they needed to develop their organs and develop their coordination, develop their fine motor and gross motor skills so that they would be prepared to sit and concentrate. And these people spared no expense in the development of their children. And this school is what I call a 1% school. It's where the 1% of the people that rule our society send their children. 
and they are all being raised. Um, I think Ellen's Ellen White's method. And um, so that was a very interesting experience for me to see and observe. And I feel very, very strongly the thing that I would say um, to anybody looking to get out into the country um, with children, the most important thing that you can do is follow the Spirit of Prophecy Council with your children um, and country living because people are paying big, big money to raise their children like that. Um, and uh, this education that this family was paying for was on top of my salary, which was you know, a significant salary as well. So, um, okay. So now I will transition. Um, I had this wonderful experience for two years um, and the experience of living in Salem as I was um, working with the children. Um, and I, it was a really wonderful time again in my life. Um, and I had planned, I was accepted into a master's degree program. I was intending, uh, the tuition was free and I had a very solid future planned for myself and life was gonna be click, 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 perfect, wonderful, everything. Um, and I had, um, I had invited my mother. My mother had moved down to Southern Illinois um, to help me with the health food store. And she stayed when I went to Boston and I had invited her to come out and I had hoped she would live there with me, but she said she felt that the Lord was really calling her to live in Southern Illinois. Um, and I asked her a couple of different times and she said, no, she felt like the Lord was living, calling her. And as time went on, I, I really felt that I needed to go home and help my mom out and be with her. And, um, and so I was doing that and um, I was thinking that, and then I felt a very strong pull um, October of 2019 that I needed to leave. Um, so, I got everything ready um, and I went back home to Southern Illinois. And right after that, COVID blew wide open in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, Boston is the home of a lot of pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And my employer works in the vaccine, um, in the pharmaceutical uh, company. She works in... Um, she doesn't, but the company is involved in vaccine research as well. And, um, and I really loved this family. They really loved me as well. Um, and I felt such a burning in my heart that I needed to give them the three angels messages. They, they were a Catholic family. They are a Catholic family. And I gave them, the Lord um, opened the way for that. And I gave them the full three angels messages. And I was certain that I was going to get fired. Um, they did not fire me. And um, I was very touched. I was even the more in love with them. And, um, and they were just a really wonderful family, but they worked in um, the pharmaceutical industry. And now that I look back, I can see that the Lord moved me out of Boston, number one, um, because it was it's a very strict city uh, with regards to COVID. And secondly, he removed me from that family and from my community there because I would have, it would have been terrible for both of us. Um, I would not have been quiet about my views. I would have felt that the Lord was calling me to express my views and warn people. And as I look back on that, I can see that that was not the Lord's timing and the Lord's way. So he moved me right out of there. So I had money and um, I, I was fine and independent and I was walking with the Lord. Everything was great. Um, but I moved back to Southern Illinois and the minute I moved back, life just started to tank again. And yet I did not feel bad because I knew this is where the Lord wanted me to be um, and to be with my mom. And um, so we moved to a rural city. Um, a, a rural country 
or town, I guess I should say. I'm, we're in the middle of this town and we've tried to get out of here and look at properties, et cetera. And the, the doors are not open. And it is a bizarre thing. I never thought that I should be here. Um, but I would say as somebody who's divorced, who doesn't have children and who lives and takes care of, you know, um, mom at home, I would say that that is, this has, I can see where the Lord has had me to be here. Um, so with regards to my employment, um, I work for a ministry uh, currently, but when I came back, I did not work for a ministry. I took a temporary job and worked from home. And in the beginning, COVID didn't even phase me. Everything was fine. Um, the temporary job, I had to quit the temporary job um, due to some extenuating circumstances. And then I began to feel the COVID weight just like everybody else. And my funds ran dry and I, just all these bad things started happening. Um, and as that happened, I look back and I praise the Lord that I am here and not in Boston. Um, and he has me where I need to be. Um, I'm in the Midwest and the Midwest is, I'm from, you know, the West Coast, which is very liberal and left. And I would say sometimes it's hard for me to be in the culture of the Bible Belt, even though I've been raised as a Christian, it's hard because um, sometimes there's a little conflict, I think, between church and state. I, I find that a little difficult sometimes. On the other hand, I think it's wonderful to live in the Midwest because people are loud and proud about Jesus Christ over here, and I'm appreciating that in this time. Um, I also appreciate that people know how to suffer in the Midwest. Um, this is an area where there are coal miners and farmers, and these people have lived through some very tough times, and they're very self-reliant and community-minded, and I appreciate that. Um, I really, really appreciate that. So, um, so I went to work for a ministry, and of course, the wage differential is enormous. In a ministry, your wages are, you know, well, it's not even a wage, but I do receive a stipend. And um, what I can say about that is the Lord is teaching me how to depend on him financially. And I've known that to some extent in my life. Um, before I left for Boston, you remember, I prayed for a car and the Lord gave me a wonderful vehicle. Um, so I already had some experience in relying on the Lord and that continues to be my experience. And I don't think I'd trade that for anything. Um, I have since been offered very lucrative jobs. It's I could easily take them and be making a lot of money, but I think that I'm doing what I need to be doing. I feel um, that the Lord led me uh, here and um, that I need to choose to um, um, make changes that will ally with the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of earth. And um, I don't want to be in a position where I am financially, um, where I look to the world for my finances. I want to be in a position where I look to heaven for my finances and needs. I believe that God is my husband. My employer is not my husband. Society is not my husband. Um, my neighbors are not my husband. My peer group is not my husband, but God is my husband and my provider. And that is the experience that I am digging into further and further as time goes on. Um, so regarding um, ministry, um, I have, um, when I was here before, as I shared with you, I had the health food store. A lot of my former customers call me and ask me for advice. I do Facebook posts for my customers and I have been very, very vocal on Facebook about the vaccine. Um, I have, I, there are customers of mine who have gotten the vaccine and customers of mine who have not gotten the vaccine. Um, and I have really worked not to polarize people against the vaccine. I have, my desire has been to show people that the medical system um, 
is a part of the beast system when it compels um, a mandate against the body and our body, our very first owner is Jesus Christ and we must follow the health message. Um, and so I have talked to people um, about the abortion argument of the vaccine. I have also talked to people about the clean and unclean meats. I think this is a very big part and clean and unclean foods. Um, this is a very big component of the health message. I believe that people are not aware that um, the vaccine has agents that are from um, biological kinds is what I call them. These are agents that are not compatible with the human body and they in and of itself mixing species will introduce a viral toxic load to the human body aside from the vaccine issue. And so I've talked to people about that. I, um, If you are from Med Missionary, then you know that we have health lectures that um, uh, Dr. Joyce Ch uh, Che has provided for us. I am in the process of um, giving those on Facebook for everybody to listen to. Um, I was just invited last night to go over to someone's house and do fomentations. Um, I've applied for a $5,000 grant. I will know this week if I get it and you guys can all pray with me that I will get it. But um, I am, I've developed an herbal curriculum and I will take it to the local public schools and I will implement this curriculum at the public schools and teach health education with the children. Um, and I prefer to work with middle schoolers and high schoolers a bit more, um, but I will do that. And, um, and I'm talking to my neighbors. And um, so I feel that I have a very broad area to work from. And even though it's weird, I would not have expected to be in a, in a rural town, in the middle of a rural town. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for me to work in this area and um, to pass out literature, which my mother and I have done together um, and we will continue to do. And um, yeah, so I would say um, that has been what I've been up to. And then finally, um, some Bible promises and spirit of prophecy quotes that I could share with other people as they transition to the country. Um, I would say this, one of the quotes that I think of and have been learning is to be thankful in all things. Um, if you have money, um, be thankful. If you don't have money, be thankful. If you are having a good time in your life, be thankful. If you're having a bad time, be thankful. Um, one of the things I can look back on my life is to realize that there were times I was not thankful for things. And I'm really sorry about that because in the end, everything worked out the way it was supposed to work out. And if I had had gratitude in the moment, I think it would have been a lot easier for me um, and those around me, but also it's, I think, important to have gratitude for Jesus because Jesus is working everything out um, for our good, even the hard things, the sorrowful things, he's working them out for our good. And, um, and when you have gratitude, you can take those lessons in better, I think. Um, another verse that I have thought of a lot is Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, the verse that says um, that Moses chose to suffer with the children of Israel rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for a season. Um, I think that that is something that I have really thought about a lot Um if I wanted to, I could go back to Boston. I, I could go anywhere. Um, being a nanny is a very high demand profession. And um, um, there are endless opportunities and it's an incredibly lucrative um, career path, I suppose, to take. Um, but I have 
really understood that my life is best spent doing what the Lord wants me to do. Um, and I have so much fulfillment when I look back and I do what he has wanted me to do. Um, the times that I feel a lot of regret for is when I did not do what he wanted me to do, when I did not go down a painful path that I should have gone down um, or an uncomfortable path that I should have gone down because I preferred to avoid it. So I would say to be thankful in all things and to know that I'm preparing for a better la land, um, to not enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for a season. Those two things have been um, very important to me. And um, I just wanna say thank you all for listening to my testimony and thank you for listening to me motor on. And I think that's all I have to share. Blessings to all of you.